Thanks, Margaret, and it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Divya Bana, the keynote speaker for this morning. I've been aware of Divya's work for many, many years, so it's great to, to meet you, and um, we've had email correspondence in the past, and um, Divya contributed to a special issue of a journal that I edited um, with Judah McLeod and Joanne Dilbert a few years ago. Divya holds um, a Department of Science and Technology National Research Foundation um, of South Africa Research Chair, Saatchi, um, in Gender and Childhood Sexuality, Violence, Inequalities and Schooling. And there, of those chairs, <coughs> there are less than 200 in South Africa. They're one of the most highly competitive um, chairs in, in, in that country. The most, um, the most, I guess, um, equivalent in Australia would be of a Laureate Fellowship. Except where ours go for five years, I discovered from Divya yesterday, hers goes for 15 years. Um, so quite an amazing um, research chair. So Divya is a professor in the School of Education at the University of KwaZulu Natal. She's published widely in the field of childhood sexualities, gender inequalities and schooling. Her inquiries into the complex dynamics of children's gendered and sexual cultures and questions about how schools can work towards gender, equality, take on an interdisciplinary, sorry, gender and sexual cultures and questions about how schools can work towards gender equality, take on an interdisciplinary approach, drawing on the sociology of childhood, critical feminist and sexuality studies, masculinities and the political economy. Her latest book on same-sex sexualities and schooling is titled Under Pressure, the Regulation of Sexualities in South African Secondary Schools. Her book, Childhood Sexuality and AIDS Education, the Price of Innocence will be published in 2015. That's out now? Yeah. yeah. Um, by Routledge, New York. She is co-editor of Books and Babies, Pregnancies, Pregnancy and Young Parents at School, and a co-author of Towards Equality, Gender in South African Schools During the HIV AIDS Pandemic. So Divya, we are really thrilled that you've made the journey here, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thanks very much. Martin, I'm extremely privileged and honoured to be your, one of your keynote speakers um, for this year and I am um, really, really grateful for, for the generosity. Uh, firstly, I'd like to begin uh, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. So, the title of my paper is Gender and Childhood Sexualities in the South, Agency and Vulnerability. And I want to begin firstly by acknowledging um, the 1st of December. Today, the 1st of December is World AIDS Day. In Australia, there were 1,236 new HIV diagnoses in 2013 with an estimated 26,800 people living with HIV infection. In South Africa, on the other hand, approximately 340,000 new infections were reported in 2013, with over 6.4 million people infected with the disease, with great gender disparity in the rates of infection, leading to global calls for gender equality and to end women in girls' vulnerability in the heterosexual spread of the disease, which is the case in much of sub-Saharan Africa. So, the reason why I mentioned my title is when, I, when Martin invited me many months ago, I had no idea that my presentation will be on the 1st of December. And when I discovered that it's on the program, because there are many things that I could talk about, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was um, issues around same-sex sexualities, issues around culture, and the ways in which homosexuality is constructed as un-African. I also wanted to talk to you about virginity testing and the ways in which girls are complicit in uh, supporting cultural practices, which many of us in the West, and even in South Africa, in terms of its progressive gender laws, might be regarded as uh, contaminating 
to efforts towards a progressive gender relations and equitable gender relationships. So these are the kinds of things that I was thinking about when Martin first invited me. And when I discovered that actually it's World AIDS Day, I have to remain loyal to the issues that matter in the South and emerge from the South. So today, the focus of my talk will be on what does it mean to be a child between the ages of seven and eight, whether you're white, um, living in some of the most posh of suburbs in the country, very much like Perth and even better, or, and, or, and what does it mean to be poor, living in amidst poverty, food insecurity, unemployment, and of course, high levels of HIV. I live and work in the province, KwaZulu-Natal, which is regarded according to the great um, uh, experts in, in epidemiology of HIV, um, regarded as the epicenter of the AIDS pandemic. And so, let me begin. So an overview of the paper. I want to just focus on the, some of the main findings and whilst there are other findings for the, for the purpose of this morning's um, paper, I want to only focus on two of them, which is AIDS and stigma and AIDS is rape. Okay, I'm not sure if you could see this, but I would read this. Never have a picture of a well-adjusted African on the cover of your paper or in it, unless that African has won the Nobel Prize, an AK-47, prominent ribs, naked breast, use these. If you must include an African, make sure you get one in Maasai or Zulu or Dogon dress. Among your characters, you must always include the starving African who wanders the refugee camp nearly naked and waits for the benevolence of the West. Her children have flies on their eyelids and pot bellies, and her breasts are flat and empty. She must look utterly helpless. She can have no past, no history. Such diversions ruin the dramatic moment. Her children are all delinquent. Always end your paper with Nelson Mandela saying something about rainbows or renaissances because you care. Now, why was I attracted to this, to this quote by the Kenyan author Wainena, of course, Nelson Mandela? And I thought how best to focus on one of the core themes that I want to explore through an interrogation and investigation of my ethnographic work with seven and eight-year-old children, black, white, rich, and poor. How best do I get the message across around agency and vulnerability? Um, as Martin um, indicated earlier, my work draws from a range of theories uh, and a range of fields, including childhood studies, where issues around agency in the West, in the North, um, are really important in trying to understand young children and young people in terms of their agentic capabilities and capacities. But I've also been inspired by Raywan Connell. Now, my discussion this morning is not going to take you into a theoretical route using Raywan Connell because we know about Raywan and we know about his brilliant pieces of work, including Southern Theory. So, I have been inspired by Raywan Connell's Southern Theory. And I take on the challenge of developing an understanding of childhood sexualities in the South as it is enacted in unequal relations of power, lived in the crucible of poverty, gender inequalities, food insecurity, violence, and HIV. Like Connell, I do not propose a new orthodoxy. Rather, in my close-focused ethnographic examination of children between the ages of seven and eight, I am mindful of the ways in which theorists in the North, and many of you who are sit here this morning, continue to influence my thinking about power and children's agency, and whose shoulders I stand on 
as I continue to interrogate gender and childhood sexuality in South Africa. Indeed, I am indebted to many of you and many of the theorists, including Barry Thorne in the US and significant others in, in the UK and in Australia that have influenced my work in relation to children's agency and the ability of children to exercise power. At the same time, however, and taking heed of Raywan Connell, I pay attention to what is in and from the South. And being loyal to what is in and from the South means that we need to pay attention to the social and cultural conditions which continue to produce harmful gender and sexual relations. So a focus on the cultural conditions on the circumstances through which young children navigate the routines of their everyday lives in and out of school is as necessary as is the focus on power and agency. And so that is my punchline for this morning's keynote. So how do we write and theorize about boys and girls and childhood sexualities in the South? And so under these conditions of economic misery, and precarious social existences, African childhoods, as Wainena has represented here, has often been represented as in crisis, catastrophic, and a calamity. Concerns about orphans due to disease, due to HIV and war, and the youth bulge, overpopulation, and brutal conditions of existence have reproduced the conceptualization of African childhoods as vulnerable, where girls in particular are rendered vulnerable and are made to submit, of course constructed as such, to male sexual predators and hordes of African young men lurking the province, uh, lurking the continent, impregnating innocent, pathetic, pitiful, utterly helpless, in Wanena's words, women and girls. Now, my punchline is really about how do we keep agency and vulnerability in tension so that children are not constructed as pitiful and helpless, as passive um, blank slates, as research around the globe, particularly in the West, drawing from childhood studies, has illustrated so well, and which I too am indebted to. But how do we go beyond simply children's ability to act sexually, children's ability to do gender? How do we keep the tension between that kind of agency and the brutal conditions which continue to mark the experience in the South and in South Africa, um, the experiences shaped by the histories and legacies of apartheid, the effects of colonization, the persistent economic inequalities, unemployment, neoliberal policies, which reproduce, in the main, the African poor. So, in developing an understanding of childhood and sexuality, I recognize that the, that the experience in the colonized world, and in particular, apartheid's vestiges of inequalities, requires different kinds of agendas for theory building than the familiar agendas that arise in the North. More recently, Becky Francis and Carrie Pector have noted these concerns. So we recognize that some of the theoretical questions we discuss pale into insignificance when we consider, for example, the gender-based violence pervading some schooling systems in places distant from the metropolitan global north. We also need to appreciate that not only are there good reasons to maintain gender distinctions based on sexed bodies, where these relate to access to important goods such as, such as education and health care, but we also need to maintain these distinctions because of the particular conditions that continue to mark the global south, and in South Africa in particular. So reflecting critically on gender and childhood sexualities, I've been careful not to fall into the trap 
of glorifying children's agency without attention to the broader social and cultural context through which agency is produced and constrained. So whilst I share in Wainena's mockery of the popular representation of pitiful, pitiful women and delinquent children of Africa, I argue at the same time that this stereotype should not be replaced by the denial of the complex, discursive and multiple material inequalities that continue to constrain children's lives. So, today, 1st of December, and this morning, on this World AIDS Day, is an opportune moment to turn attention to the social constructions of gender and sexuality in children's AIDS-related knowledge. I ask, how do boys and girls in grade two, that's a message, how do boys and girls in grade two, aged between seven and eight years old, in the South African province of KwaZulu-Natal, give meaning to the disease? Under what social circumstances are these meanings contested and negotiated? So to explore these questions in an ethnographic and interview mode, I work with children in two vastly different race and class settings. One rich, one poor, give you a sense of the context. The poor, of course, being exclusively African. Both contexts are located in the eastern seaboard city of Durban, reflecting affluence and adversity, poverty and plenty, and as I have argued, striking reminders of the effects of history, colonization, and apartheid. So, school one, poor African, context of school two. Okay, so there's many more pictures that I could illustrate to you, but I think these telling and strikingly different contrasting settings will provide you with a sense of why we need to hold on, hold intention, agency, and vulnerability. So to date, few studies place African children as young as seven and eight at the center of investigation in their own right for what they can tell us about gender and sexuality. Nor have there been any attempts to address prevention with younger boys and girls that consider children as sexual agents as social agents with the capacity to engage with sexuality and sex, as well as with AIDS. And this, of course, is a global concern. As Jackson and Scott note, childhood free from the shadow of sexuality is thought necessary both to keep children safe and to secure their future sexual health. Children, I argue, have been shortchanged by the discourses of childhood innocence. As adults, we hide sexuality and silence it. We presume childhood sexual innocence and we don't pay much attention to children's pains and pleasures and we wish childhood sexuality away. When children express sexuality, we laugh it off as playful, innocent and frivolous. Childhood innocence has become a motif embedded within relations of power and functions as a powerful mechanism of normalization and exclusion producing an exclusive focus on the vulnerable child needing adult protection from sex and sexuality. In the context of the pressing risk to HIV, we still assume that children are too young to understand sexual knowledge. Young children remain, as Joe uh, Tobin and Jonathan Sillen have so well argued almost two decades ago, young children remain too quiet for us to hear, too small for us to see, that they fall beneath our threshold of attention. Childhood innocence and the need for protection justify silence and adult inaction around effective sexuality and AIDS education. And so the price of innocence, I argue, is the continued inattention and neglect to children's own conceptualization and experience of sexuality, gender, and in the context of HIV, um, their own vulnerability and agency in dealing with it. So central to my study are seven and eight-year-olds. 
and the complex operation of power. Children interpret, shape, and negotiate meanings of the disease as they expand, explore, and elaborate upon their gendered and heterosexual selves. The process of transgressing, shaping, and negotiating gendered and sexual meanings of the disease is highly complex. So they do so in ways, from my experience as an ethnographer, they do so as ways which express excitement, pleasure and power within a heteronormative context as they negotiate and accommodate dominant ideas of innocence, but also dominant ideological positions which create the othering of the African poor and the othering of HIV. And of course, at the heart of the paradox between children's knowledge of sex, of sexuality, and of AIDS, the, the quest and the desire of world organizations like UNESCO, um, excellent policy prescriptives in South Africa which advance sexual health, um, stand in contrast to our continued focus on children as innocent and this lies at the heart of the paradox. And again, inspired by Connell, this takes on a local, a local manifestation of innocence, but has reached through a global understanding of children and the ways in which we construct children as innocent and not knowing. So in 2003, for instance, 4.2 million people in South Africa were, uh, were living with HIV. In 2014, this had jumped to 6.4 million. Um, 1.7 million people live with HIV in the province that I live in. It is estimated that 15% of Africans are infected compared to 0.3% of whites. And for those of us, and I always make this very clear, is that race and class in South Africa, despite uh, changes and ongoing changes to um, the emergence of um, a black elite, race and class are intimately tied so that the African remains poor in the main. Um, much faith has been placed in educational initiatives to provide young people with relevant knowledge and skills to help them avoid the disease with specific emphasis on gender inequalities and unequal uh, power relations, especially within intimate partner relations, noting the heterosexual dimension in the spread of the disease. So in terms of, of policy, in terms of educational prescriptions, and in terms of um, UNESCO's um, in the world of AIDS, we have a choice to make. We need to lead children, could lead children to find their own way through the clouds of misinformation, or we could take up the challenge. So by focusing on seven and eight year old children as they give meaning to AIDS, I take issue with the conceptualization of children as passive and an inattention to gender and childhood sexuality. So one of the central aims then is to situate sexuality um, at the center of how we conceptualize and theorize children. And by paying attention to children in the diverse social context, the study also highlights race, class, gender, age, and sexuality, which cut through children's meanings of the disease and set limits to agency. And so I seek to break from the adult scripts of childhood innocence um, and draw attention to the active ways in which gender and sexuality is produced under social and economic, and of course, might I add, striking conditions of inequality. So overall then, a focus on boys and girls under the age of 10 might contribute to and reconfigure international debates on childhood innocence agency and sex and AIDS education. One that conceives of sexuality as central to children's meanings of AIDS, but again, and I rehearse and repeat that, but remains faithful to the effect of material, cultural, symbolic, and discursive forces 
which constrain meaning and agency. In particular, I summon us as adults to rethink our special responsibility to children in the time of AIDS and to shed our taken for granted assumptions about innocence so that we will open our understanding to the creative ways in which children all over the world and of course in the South where research um, children's voices in the South remain marginalized under strikingly unequal social conditions. So let me rehearse what have I done thus far. Firstly, I have taken up the challenge of Raywin Connell um, in Southern Theory by making a case for the study of gender and childhood sexualities in South Africa in relation to both agency and vulnerability. And in this, challenge, in this challenge, I draw from the issues of and from the South. I explore the issues around agency and vulnerability, and of course, make a strong argument about local context, with the possibility of extending our understandings of children on a global context. And how do I do this? I've done this through the optic of AIDS. And I've argued that childhood sexual innocence is a paradox, especially in the context of children's right to increased knowledge of and need for information about sexuality and notions of childhood sexual innocence. So this is what I've done thus far. What is to come next? In the next part of the paper, I want to explore some of the theorizing with particular reference to agency and vulnerability. And in yesterday's session, which Kerry Robinson was leading, there was also discussion about vulnerability. And I realized that even in Australia, when particular marginalized communities are being talked about, the focus is vulnerability. So I want to, 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 to briefly talk about what it means to theorize children in relation to agency and vulnerability before I head directly into some of the main findings, which are not all the findings, which I will refer to as AIDS stigma and AIDS as rape, before I reach a conclusion. Okay, so let me continue. So theorizing childhood sexuality, and I, Fairborn says that what we see is largely shaped by the frame of the glasses through which we look at the world. So the, the entire, um, this project that I worked on draws not only from learners, but for today's discussion, I'm containing it to that uh, focus. But it also included adult teachers in grade two and grade four, and it also included mothers of young children. And so the paradox was very clear in terms of how adult teachers and mothers constructed children's innocence and how and what children said to me in the research conflicted heavily. And this paradox creates the mockery of childhood innocence. So what we see then is shaped by the frame of glasses. And the frame of glasses that mothers and teachers mainly wear is one where children as young as seven and eight do not know sex, should not know sex. And so the dominant thinking is, or the wishful thinking is children are innocent. And in my, um, as I search through, throughout the globe in terms of how young children are constructed, this remains a dominant theme throughout the world. So in developing a theoretical framing, I rely on a multi-dimensional understanding of power, uh, which is fluid. And of course, I draw from Foucauldian notions um, of power as a capillary, as a network, and changing, which allows us to make sense of children's complex contextual positionings as gendered and sexual beings. So to do this, as Martin illustrated, I draw from a variety of sources. I draw from post-feminist, post-structuralist work, from queer theorists, 
from um, sociology of childhood, from um, Johann Galtung's, which Paul Farmer um, has adopted, notions of structural violence uh, to emphasize gender and sexuality in the construction of agency. I want to make an important point here. Um, I think that educational research has much to benefit from understandings of these interconnections. I focus heavily in my own work on the political economy of sexuality. And so these kind of cross drafts, theoretical cross drafts, has been very beneficial in trying to understand issues in and from the South. So in building this theoretical cross draft, I'm, um, I'm deeply sensitive to, um, of course not uh, ensuring that the issues are not determined by social structures, as gender, sexuality, race, age, and class coalesce in children's construction and articulation of HIV. So the themes of social inequalities and agency pervade this paper and are in constant tension with each other. So sexuality is obviously key in understanding um, children. And um, I draw from the work, the, the, the work of Weeks, and uh, who argues that sexuality is, you know, pervades the air that we breathe. Of course, this air is reserved for adults. It is fully social and involves sexual desires and practices beyond a simple biological definition of, of sex. So how do we explain the truth about childhood sexuality? Who can speak the truth about childhood sexuality? And so the dominant discourse of childhood sexual innocence creates certain truths marked by profound adult child relations and inequalities um, and constructions of sexuality as in, con as in conflict with childhood. So um, an abiding concern then in this paper is the relationship between childhood sexuality and the construction of childhood sexual innocence, as well as the construction of AIDS as a sex-related disease. So the discourse of childhood innocence is naturalized and its harmful effects for others are concealed because the power that is attached to these meanings um, make childhood sexuality and, um, and, and sex inimical to each other. Now, um, when I draw from the work of uh, the, the great theorists and, and many of you sitting here on childhood studies, the one important point that has been relevant to the work in South Africa has been the issue around agency. And here, children are treated as speaking, knowing and experiencing subjects, as social actors involved in the social worlds they live in and as interactive agents who engage with people, ideologies and institutions um, through the engagement and forge a place for themselves in their own social worlds. And this is a quote from Alan. So, as speaking, knowing and experiencing subjects, children are accorded power that is often denied to them. And so therefore, the attraction to a conceptualization and a theoretical positioning about children's agency but they're also ensnared within power, limiting their freedoms to express and negotiate sexuality. So of particular concern that I have are the ways in which boys and girls construct power entrenched within states of gender and cultural domination. In South Africa, there's growing evidence of how schools are places where rigid understandings of masculinity and femininity leading, in some instances, to an extremely limited margin of freedom. So despite variations in masculinity and femininity. So how do I talk about masculinities and femininities and in, it, at an international conference without also being wary about the grim realities that face young children in the South? And these, these grim realities mean that for some children, it matters who you are and where you are in South Africa. For some children, the experience of schooling is toxic. Patterns, daily patterns of sexual assault and sexual harassment by male peers and teachers 
have received widespread media coverage in the recent past. In fact, the Human Rights Watch first documented such instances in 2001. In my research with teenagers, I have documented how girls state they are not free both in and out of the school. Fearful, mindful, alert to the gazes, the nonverbal responses of adult male teachers, of male peers that harass them, of walking to and from school, being afraid of sugar daddies in big cars trying to lure them with money, with gifts, and inside the home, scared of their mother's boyfriends. And when they do accompany some of their mothers who are in the main, particularly in the African township context, who are domestic workers, they are afraid of their mother's male employer. So this kind of grim reality faces some South African children in some contexts all the time. So, children then are not separate from the social and cultural conditions through which we understand their agency and vulnerability. So, sexuality is thus conceptualized here in ways that make it possible to understand that children are sexual and gendered agents. They do express an interest in, have an investment in sexuality, are not, and of course I have defied the construction of a loveless Africa, of teenagers simply being constructed and demarcated as um, uh, pregnant or victims of sexual predators, that young people do indeed invest in relationships based on care and love, but then how do we understand that in terms of structural violence? And so sexuality then, thus is conceptualized as both age agentic, but also in ways that make us make it possible to understand children as agents in tension and along, working alongside dominant social structures despite the fact that agency can be expressed even in very constrained circumstances. Now, how do I bring all of this together? I, I uh, Structural violence is a concept that Paul Farmer has adopted from Johann Gautum, and it um, suggests that um, a social machinery of oppression, the impact of extreme poverty and social marginalization one way of putting it is that the degree to which agency is constrained is correlated inversely, if not always neatly, with the ability to resist marginalization and other forms of oppression. I do have a problem with Paul Farmer. I, I've, I find the work fascinating and I've drawn on it um, and it makes so much sense in understanding children and in understanding the ways in which gender and sexuality are constructed in the context of HIV. But one of my punchlines as I began is really to see structure and, 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 and social agency and children as in tension with each other. We need to also find agency and to express the ways in which children actually live, which is far from simply being victims of uh, HIV and victims of structural violence without um, abandoning the significance of such um, inequalities that pervade children's lives. So, uh, feminist researchers like Correa, Bicheski and Parker have been really helpful in a deeper understanding uh, of structure. Um, and they too draw from the work of Farmer. But, um, by f and so Farmer argues that gender power inequalities, poverty, economic distress, racism, social marginalization contribute to vulnerability. Uh, contribute to oppressive social relations and vulnerability. So, Johann Gautum coined the term structural violence to describe social structures, including economic, cultural, and political structures that reduce the ability of people to act. So, violence, according to Gautum, is not a physical image, 
but is entrenched, but is an, an entrenched normalization and experience of these social structures. Now, Parker argues against Farmer's mechanistic model of political economy, arguing as feminist post-structuralist theories support a model that is more in, uh, dependent upon an interactive relationship between structure and agency, recognizing the increasing importance of structural violence within conceptions of sexuality has thus been very helpful in my own work, as I have been able to argue that inequalities that are situated in historical and economic contexts shape the possibilities for agency. In other words, sexual cultures can never be understood without gender, race and class and other forms of social inequalities through which sexual relations are organized. In putting structure and agency together, Parker notes that the social ordering of social relations, of sexual contact, draws attention to the socially and culturally determined differentials in power. So whilst agency and power have been constructed as malleable and plastic, an understanding of children's vulnerability to social con conditions, not of their own choosing, remains important. So in my research with children in different school contexts, this point becomes really salient because the manifestation of children's experience of and investment in gender and sexuality speaks directly to, not determined by, but speaks directly to and interacts with these broader social and cultural conditions. And so one might argue that perhaps we could end the problem in South Africa by simply adding millions of Australian dollars or euros. And with the RAND doing it the way it is, it perhaps will make a difference. But that is indeed not the only answer. It is also about the ideologies of gender and sexuality, the cultural dynamics, and the ways in which both masculinities and femininities are constructed, which are based on relations of power and hierarchies. So I do argue then for an understanding of children as both agents and vulnerable, as material and embedded within the material, symbolic and discursive forces which effectively limit their opportunities and freedoms and diminish their agency and call into question the very social conditions which allow for such inequalities. So let me go then straight into some of the rich uh, uh, empirical uh, evidence which illustrates the points that I have been making. So in the first case, um, I want to talk about AIDS and stigma. And so for those of us working within a kind of post-structuralist and pious mood, the, the use of the word stigma seems problematic. However, um, work by Peter Agleton, Richard Parker, um, 2003, a very classic uh, uh, article has been helpful in understanding that stigma goes beyond Goffman's understanding of stigma as something being inherently static. So stigma is really located within the kind of conditions and that children use these uh, stigmatizing discourses in ways that are both fluid, changing, and of course repro uh, reproduce uh, othering. So, the, so if you don't want to catch AIDS, you stay away from people. The catching AIDS was one of the, 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 the kind of frequent ways in which young children talked about HIV. You stay away from people that have AIDS. Even if they don't have cuts, you just stay away. Like if you do not want to catch it, I would not go near anybody, somebody that had it. Um, so this kind of issue around contagion was, um, was, was, was a dominant discourse across both school sites. But I want to now focus on the richer context, the context in which majority white um, um, and the ways in which HIV is then constructed there. So a significant characteristic of HIV-related stigma is that the disease has to do with Africans, AIDS-related people who are constructed as inherently diseased and promiscuous. And even at seven and eight, young children are already inducting and already um, forging 
um, into these kinds of relations of power and stigma. So children's knowledge of black men as vectors in the spread of the disease was premised upon their association and knowledge of African men and women who worked in their homes as domestic laborers in South Africa. Many scholars in the country have noted how dominant African masculinities shape men's control over women and celebrate multiple partners. So children then talked about um, uh, not just contagion, but they also talked about domestic workers and um, young people, domestic workers in their homes. For example, Beatrice. And Beatrice talks about her gardener and her gardener who died of AIDS. And Beatrice says, um, as the transcripts go on, don't touch it, don't touch it, is an emotionally powerful as it reproduces popular constructions and, and anxieties around contagion, as well as around race and class. So unlike apartheid though, the new equation of racism is now one that constructs blacks as AIDS vectors. So children's constructions of race and AIDS related stigma takes place in a web of competing access to meanings and symbols and representations of HIV. Um, I want to, to focus on this, which I thought was very interesting. So here, Diane relates um, HIV to witchcraft and how witchcraft is also related to, to AIDS. Some people, they actually want to give other people AIDS, like, like kill them. And they actually take them to the witch doctor and they kill the people at the witch doctor. And they take their blood and make a special potion. And that potion is in us. And they make other people get AIDS and very sick because they are taking the blood to make juice or something. And people drink that from the shops and they actually get very bad AIDS. So it like kills them and the people that have AIDS, they catch them again. And they take the blood from them and they make everyone get more and more AIDS and give it to every single person and people get more and more AIDS. I tried to relate this the way Diana, or Diane related this to me in terms of um, the emotive language and the, the, the kind of misinformation and the ways in which witchcraft and crime and danger in South Africa, including race and class issues, get entangled in the construction of AIDS. Now, how then do we understand this explanation of sorcery and witchcraft? So, Diane comes from a context where there is little, very little experience of HIV, except, as I uh, referred to earlier, with the proximity with gardeners and domestic workers. Um, taking a cue from Tripler, who in 1999 argued that even children are able to make sense of the disease, but even, even imperfectly, reproducing conspiracy and racialized views that have social and historical specificity as they try to understand this terrifying phenomenon known as AIDS. Um, historical evidence um, in South Africa shows how selected body parts were removed from deceased people were used to enhance magical powers amongst the Isi Zulu in the province um, where I live and work in, the majority Isi Zulu much to the condemnation of colonial forces who subjected those who killed in the name of witchcraft to punitive laws, including the removal of cattle, which was a prized economic possession. So when children talk about witchcraft, they talk about histories in South Africa. They relate this not only to contemporary concerns about HIV, race, class, but they draw from um, a myths and understandings of witchcraft that relate to colonial times. So ch children incite the horror of AIDS, linking it with blood, with magical potions, race and crime. And of course, this is a highly racialized pattern. Africans do bear the brunt of the disease. And in giving credence to the history, the theory of the witch doctor extends the racial divide and separates the disease and distances uh, and distances and others and construct Africans as, of course, the AIDS vectors. So even at age seven and eight, young children are able to make sense of AIDS 
deploy conspiracy theories that are invented and shaped by agents. And these children at seven and eight are agents in the social construction of AIDS and putting together ideas of blood, magic, witch doctors, race, history, colonization, class, violence, and crime to forge a racialized and specific theory about AIDS based on conspiracy. Now, this is not the only way in which children in this context talked about HIV. They also talked about HIV in relation to care. And um, I'm not going to go too much into that except to say that, um, for, for example, Alex was saying, we go to church, we go to help people with AIDS, and we give them bread and stuff. Um, and so there was high levels of reflection and empathy towards those children who are suffering from AIDS. Um, and so they don't have TV, said Alistair, uh, to know about AIDS, and they don't have their mothers and fathers, and their mothers and fathers haven't had TVs in all their lives, so they probably don't know about AIDS. And maybe they don't even have their mums and dads, so their mums and dads can't tell them about, about, about AIDS. Maybe they're orphans. So what, because they are always out there on the streets and all the germs are out there on the streets and they have sores. So whilst I've talked about the conspiracy theories related to race and class and perpetual in construction and othering, there was this level of concern and care so when I asked, how do you know about AIDS? We watched on TV. And so they talked about going to church and going to the valley, giving food and praying for people with HIV. And so this level of care stands in direct contrast to, but sits alongside and in contradiction to the constructions of, uh, of inequalities and the othering. I want to now focus on um, AIDS is rape. And in this um, dominant theme here, AIDS is rape played out at the school, um, the setting which I illustrated earlier, that is one where children have very little access to material wealth. Their children in the main are either heading households, children live without both parents, children are living mainly with grandparents. In fact, in South Africa, statistics South Africa 215 has, has indicated that only one third of black African children live with their fathers. The relationship with their fathers is complex and this is again the effects of materiality, the effects of migrancy, the effects of colonization and apartheid. And such effects play out in the ways in which children experience at seven and eight and how they navigate their everyday lives. So AIDS is rape is, is um, a striking understanding of AIDS. So when I ask children here, what is AIDS? They said rape. What is rape? AIDS. So this was a combination. I always pray that I don't get it. I will stay away from boys. Um, so men are regarded as the vectors in the spread of the disease. So sexual coercion and male culpability remain a powerful gaze upon children's responses to AIDS. Male violence against children and women and girls um, is prevalent in many settings and in South Africa an acute social problem and it is often the root cause of women and girls heightened vulnerability to AIDS. In South Africa as Debbie Posel had noted um, violence is often the scandal of man manhood and both boys and girls lock into the scandal as they illustrate and give meaning to HIV. Um, Men and boys are especially targeted as vectors in the spread of the disease. The engagement in violent and coercive sexual relations, of course, is always encouraged for real men. And both boys and girls confirm, confirm the status of adult men at the apex of age-gender hierarchies who feed on male entitlement to sex 
through violence, heightening women and girls' risk to disease. Now, there are many stories that come out of South Africa, heinous as they might be, including the myth that um, having sex with a virgin cures HIV. Um, in fact, that such uh, terrible responses to uh, these myths has seen baby rapes. Um, and of course, whilst that is not um, uh, a common discourse in South Africa, and Rachel Jukes has argued so well about that, it does mean that these myths are still profoundly impact upon the experiences of, of women and girls. So, um, I want to reiterate the point around um, girls' fear of men. The fear of men was widespread in the focus group interviews, or the, the discussions and the conversations that I had with children. And um, the conditions in the townships increase and create uh, HIV risk situations for women and girls to sexual abuse. To me, what was most frightening was this research was conducted prior to my research with teenagers. And most striking and frightening was the continuum of violent gender relations and girls' fear of men and boys from the age of six to nine, seven to eight, but also at 16 to 17. So um, the context is not of their own making. And even under the circumstances, the girls talk creatively about the resources they could use in protecting themselves, like fleeing from, uh, fleeing from people, from bad men, going straight home, not talking to anybody on the way from school, staying away from boys, and rejecting the offers of sweets, and finally, obeying parents. I want to just take a minute here about sweets and about what it means to be a seven and eight year old walking to and from school in the conditions that I just illustrated here. What does it mean to walk to and from school under such conditions without adult um, uh, supervision, in the absence of um, care, in the absence of uh, food security, and in the context of high levels of unemployment and poverty. Now these young children live um, supported by the um, uh, child support grant and that child support grant is 320 rands divided by eight which give you approximate uh, um, Australian dollar. So that is per month. These children live on the child support grant. So when an older man offers sweets, the questions become um, significant. Now this is at seven and eight. In my research with teenagers, they talked about adult men in cars as they walked from school, propositioning them, offering them gifts, um, offering them money. Of course, these are not going to be regarded as, as uh, as, um, uh, sex work and these girls are not prostitutes. These are what Mark Hunt has called transactional relations embedded within a gift culture where older men, sugar daddies, whatever they might be called, or men and women um, engage in sexual relations based on a gift culture. And so the concern is at age seven and eight, the attraction is sweets. And at age 16 and 17, there are different forms of, uh, of attraction. And this is why the political economy of sexuality becomes really significant. So I want to draw then to, um, to some kind of conclusion and, um, uh, and to argue that to fight against AIDS, we need to put children first, quite simply. For too long, children under 10 have been left out of gender, sexuality, and health education as agents in their own right. We need to start with children where they are at, putting them at the center of our methodological and theoretical approaches. A fundamental lesson is the obsoleteness of childhood sexual innocence and the mockery of it in light of children's own knowledge of sex, 
sexuality, and of HIV. It also teaches us, from children's own point of view, about suffering, about affliction, and here I draw from Pope Pharma, and the effects of large-scale social forces on the microcosmic world of children in highly unequal social contexts as they navigate their everyday little gendered and sexual and cultural worlds. If we are to address girls and boys' power sexualities in dealing with sexuality needs and sex education more broadly, then we need to seize the opportunity and help address the contradictory and constraining discourses of childhood sexual innocence that put the sexual and, and put sexual knowledge about AIDS firmly on the agenda. Children should be the first to benefit from our successes in defeating HIV and the last to suffer from our failures. So says Anthony Lake of UNICEF. The time is long overdue for determined and systematic approach to rethinking children's agency and for promoting sexual health from the very early years of life. And so I want to remind the reader of uh, Cassandra and Natalie in, in the elite majority white context. When I ask them, so what do we need, need to know about AIDS? Why do you think we need to know about AIDS? You'll know what AIDS is and you'd know how to get AIDS and you'll be more careful. Because if you don't know about it, says Natalie, then if you could like get AIDS, you don't know what's wrong with you and you'll think it's a different kind of sickness and you think you're going to die straight away. Um, and I end here with um, Cameron's um, quote. AIDS is above all a remedial diversity. Our living and our life forces are stronger. Our capacity for wholeness as humans larger than the individual effects of the virus. Africa seeks healing. That healing lies within the power of our actions in inviting us to deal with the losses it has already inflicted and more importantly, in enjoining us to avoid future losses that our own capacity to action make necessary. AIDS beckons us to fullness and power of our own humanity. And as far as children are concerned in my own research, it is an invitation that we should avoid, that we cannot, uh, it is not an invitation that we should avoid or refuse. I thank you so much. Thanks, Divya. At the top of your um, university's template slide, um, it has University of KwaZulu Natal um, inspiring, and that was the only bit we could see, and that was so inspiring. Thank you so much for that. But it was much more than that, and I think that I would like RRE to take some credit for asking you to speak on World AIDS Day, but we can't take that credit. Um, and thank you for bringing that to our attention. I think what you've done is you've, as, as you said, you brought us issues from and of the South and you challenged us to think about that. You've asked us to think about our frames of glasses, the, the, you know, the frame of glasses that we look through and clearly that's something you're doing with your work. I think that the, um, the idea of summoning us to shed, shed our assumptions is so important and many of us here, I think, grapple with that tension of vulnerability and agency how do we address um, communities that are complete, you know, clearly oppressed without using deficit constructions of them? And I think that that's what you really forced us to think. I think you've done that by helping us to understand some of the grim realities, as you call them, of, of South Africa um, and the grim realities that people face in, in the global context. So I thank you sincerely from AARE for coming and giving us this presentation today. It truly was wonderful and inspiring. Thank you. And we have a small gift for you. <laughs>